Hello beloved, it's good to be with you and uh, once again to study the letter of Jude. We are busy with study 11 and it's amazing what we can learn as we study God's word because the, the Bible is interconnected, right? There's one message and the message is about Jesus Christ. He's the focus of scripture. So everything revolves around Christ. And this is the wonderful thing. So when we study the letter of Jude, it's not in isolation to the rest of Scripture, even though it's a letter in its, in its own right. And Jude was writing it for a specific purpose and, and everything that revolves around it. But still, there is the, it's connected to the rest of Scripture. And that's important for us to understand. So if we study Jude and we're busy with study 11, we're actually studying much more than just the letter of Jude. Before we continue, let's just have a word of prayer, and then we'll continue. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your love and kindness towards us. Thank you for this word, uh, what you gave to us, inspired by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you will open up our hearts to receive and our minds to understand. And this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, Jude. Let's read verse 3 and 4. Of Jude. This is what Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of our God into lewdness, And deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Alright, so. One of the things that, that, a question kind of that came up in my mind is, where are the false teachers? Where are these false teachers that we read about here in Jude? You know, who creeps, creeps into the church unnoticed. Now, if we go back in history, you will notice that after the Reformation, the Protestants, as they were called, those who were protested against Rome. The Protestants were, were adamant that the Catholic Church were wrong because they believed in both tradition, uh, church tradition, and they believed in the scriptures, that both were authoritative in matters of faith and practice. The Catholics, on the other hand, they believed that the Protestants were wrong. Because they believed in Scripture alone as the only authority in all matters of faith and practice. <coughs> Pardon me. So as we go through the years, groups developed like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons and others. And they were identified as false churches, uh, cults or sects or things like that where they teach false doctrine. So you, you have denominations or big groups. But the thing is, Jude tells us that false teachers can creep into the church. That means a local body, a local congregation. They can, uh, these false teachers can actually creep into a denomination, for example. But it doesn't mean that everybody has got the wrong doctrine. It can be a local church where, where these false teachers are trying to get people to believe what they teach them. So Jude tells us that these False teachers exhibit some characteristics, and that's important for us to understand. How do I, we identify these false teachers? And as I said last week, Jude tells us that these men are ungodly, or these false teachers are ungodly. Today, it's not no longer just men. It's men and women. Uh, both are teaching. I've heard women that talks the biggest load of nonsense, but I've, I've heard men that talks the biggest load of nonsense. That is not scriptural at all. Right? So, but what does these false teachers do? They are ungodly in their conduct. So they are not actually for God, even though they will say that they are for God. And then they turn the grace of our God into lewdness, which means they turn grace into some kind of thing that gives them a license to commit grosser immorality. And then the third characteristic and this is the one that I believe if you go to 1 John, 1 John tells us that who is Antichrist is he who denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. 
All right, so it's these false teachers, they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that these false teachers basically deny about Christ is the incarnation. They deny that Jesus is indeed God in the flesh. Now, if you think back to last week, you remember that last week we saw that Jesus had no beginning. Now, he's, he's the all-existent one, the one who has no beginning, but he, he is also the one who has no end. Now that we know that there, there came a time when God the Son took on the form of a human being in the person of Jesus Christ and he was born as a baby. And this event where, where Jesus takes on human form, that's known as the incarnation. Now, <clears throat> before Jesus was born as a baby, think about it. When, before Jesus was born as a baby, who was he? He was God. He was the second person in the Trinity. He's the, the second person in the Godhead. But when he was born, he took on human nature. He took on another nation. A nature. A nation. He took on another nature. That, that is the nature of man. But what is important is he did not give up his nature or the nature of God. He didn't give up his divine nature. He added a human nature to his divine nature. And this is so difficult for us to understand. So what he, what he basically did, and this is the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. He chose to empty himself of all of his rights as God for that time. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 and 7 tells it so beautiful, beautifully, and it's speaking of Jesus here. It says, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no, no repetition, uh, reputation, sorry, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. This is speaking about God, no? the triune God in the person of Jesus Christ, even though in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal to God, but what did he do? He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bondservant. He came to serve people. And by taking on the nature of man, he wasn't making himself greater than what he was. <laughs> no, he was in fact making himself less than what he was. Remember, he was fully God, fully divine with a divine nature um, and, and being God. But he took on another nature, which is the nature of man. Or a human nature. Right, so how does the incarnation work? Kind of what happened? Now, this is important for us to understand that before creation, God actually decided already that Jesus, that's God the Son, would become human. So in the Godhead, in the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the three persons in the Godhead, it was decided. Now, it, it, it's not as if God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit sat around the table and then decided, all right, God the Son will become human. Th that's not the way the Godhead works. All right, but God decided that he would become human. He would become human like other people. All right, but not in exactly the same way, but he would become human. So what did he do? He would be born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says it so clearly. So God in the person of Jesus Christ, so God the Son in the person of Jesus Christ would be born of a virgin. And, and there are a few questions which arise as we think about the incarnation of Jesus. Let me tell you. For example, why was Jesus born the way he was born? That's a good question. Why was he born the way he was born? Why couldn't he just be born in a normal way? You know, with a human mother and a human father. Why did he need to be born at all? It's another question we can ask. Why did God not just put Jesus on this earth as God without any human parents and then 
do whatever needs to be done. Why didn't he do that? Those are questions, and I, and I believe there are people that ask these questions. And let me tell you, if we are unable to discern spiritual things spiritually, then I think that's when we fall into deep, deep trouble. Because we need to discern things spiritually. We need to accept God's revelation about Himself. Now, the basic answer to many of the questions about incarnation is obviously found in Scripture. And, and it's... Let's, let's say the basic of the basic answer to the question is that the triune God chose for Jesus to be born of a virgin so that he would be fully God and that he would be, that he would be fully man at the same time. I, I believe that's the reason why God became flesh the way he did. is So that he could be fully God and fully man at the same time. So that he could have a divine nature and he could have a human nature at the same time now these things are very difficult to explain how in the world do you explain that in one person there's two two different natures some people have tried to explain it to say but we, we are body soul and spirit now nah? so i've got a body and uh but my soul i have a soul and i've got a spirit and um within the greek understanding we can say that you see we are i'm three but i'm one uh, that, that's not a good explanation because in the nature of, uh, in the human nature and the divine nature of Christ, it, it was amazing how it worked if you go through scripture and you see how it worked. You see, beloved, if, if we think about it this way, if Jesus was not fully God, he would not be able to pay for our sins. Because the sacrifice had to be a perfect sacrifice and no human being is perfect. So God had to take on flesh. God had to actually pay for our sins because human beings can't pay for their own sin. You see, so if he wasn't fully God, he could not pay for our sin. If he wasn't fully man, he could not represent human beings on the cross because he had to be fully man. You know, so because it was man who sinned and it's man who should die. So he had to be fully man so that the man, Jesus Christ, could die on behalf of men. But he had to be fully God so that he could actually pay for our sins to be perfect. <clears throat> so I believe it was necessary for Jesus to be fully God and fully man. And the only way that this could be possible was for him to be born of God. And at the same time, be born of a woman. And, and let me tell you, we accept that as truth because scripture teaches it so clearly not because we understand it so jesus was born of god and he was born of woman at the same time it's it's just so he's god and he's man it's just amazing all right so what was the reasons for the incarnation now one very important question that we must answer when we study about jesus is why did jesus come to this earth what was the reason for Jesus to become human? And I mean, many people would answer and just say, well, it's simple, it's easy, it's straightforward. He came to die for our sins. That's it. They're right. He came to die for our sin. That's, that's true. But the Bible actually gives us seven reasons why Jesus came. Let me quickly run through them. Seven reasons why Jesus came. Now, the Bible teaches, first of all, that Jesus came to reveal God to man. You see, before Jesus came, the prophets told the people about God. Now, they got revelations from God and they spoke to people about God. But when Jesus came, he came to show people what God was actually like. He came to demonstrate God's love. He demonstrated God's patience and God's faithfulness and God's power. That he came to demonstrate who God is. It, it was Jesus who said that if you see me, you see the Father. Because Jesus was the one who came to reveal God to mankind, to people. All right, so that, that, that's one of, the, one of the seven reasons why Jesus came, to reveal God to men. But the Bible also teaches us that Jesus came to, 
to provide an example for us to know how we should live to the glory of God. You see, before Jesus came, the people had God's law. They, they had this you're allowed to do, this you're not allowed to do, the do's and don'ts. But it didn't talk about everything. It just gave enough so that people could follow the laws. But if, you've, if we're very honest with one another, <clears throat> nobody actually followed all of God's laws. Everybody broke some of God's laws. Nobody was 100% perfectly obedient to God in all aspects of their lives. So what happened was Jesus set an example. He actually came to show us what it looks like if someone is to fully obey God. Oh, and that's amazing. But the Bible also teaches us thirdly that Jesus came to to this earth to become a sacrifice for our sin. And, and that's that's for sure. You see, the Old Testament sacrifices was given by God as a as a kind of a picture of the greatest sacrifice. And you can write that sacrifice in a cap with a capital S. He, he came the, the Old Testament sacrifices is just a picture of this great sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice which was to come in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, the blood of bulls and of goats and of all kinds of animals could not do what the blood of Jesus Christ did on our behalf or for us. And that's what Jesus came to do, to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. But the Bible also teaches us that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, I think this one of the things that we, we sometimes forget, especially as believers, we forget that Satan is a defeated enemy. Obviously, he has authority, he has power uh, in the sense of delegated power. Ne? He has it on this earth. He works through the sons of, the, through the sons of disobedience or the, or, or the people of the earth who are disobedient to God. He uses them as instruments. And yes, obviously, it is true that he can um, persecute uh, Christians through non-believers and all these kind of things. It's true. But he's a defeated enemy. So we should not give him the kind of power that we sometimes give him. He doesn't have that kind of power. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 says the following. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Talking about the incarnation. Eh? And through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. And that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Satan keeps us in bondage through fear. He makes us afraid. Afraid of what? He makes us afraid of all kinds of things. Now we have this pandemic fear. Everybody's afraid of the pandemic. <clears throat> so they're not focusing on God and, and, and God's sovereignty and who God is. No, they're focusing on this fear that is being instilled into people. And, and the people that are instilling the fear into others don't even know what they're talking about. Because you can listen to two or three politicians and you've got two or three different opinions. You can listen to two or three doctors, you can have two or three different opinions. I, I was watching a panel of, of professionals, oncologists and radiologists and um, surgeons that works with cancer patients. And I was amazed to see the panel um, not agree on, on, on the kind of treatment that people are supposed to have. And I thought to myself, and they got to treat us? And they can't even agree on these things? You see, what happens is, we, and, and we need to be so careful, we need to accept one truth. And that truth is God's truth. God's revealed truth. Don't fall for all these other things. There's a fear that is being instilled into people. The only one we should fear is God himself, the living God. That's the one we should fear. Let me run quickly because our time is running out. Now, the Bible also teaches us, fifthly, that Jesus came to become a merciful high priest. You see, the, the name Emmanuel means God with us, ne? And since, since Jesus went back to heaven, we can say that there is a man that is now with God. It, it, and I know it's kind of plastic when I say that. 
Man is with God in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus who understands us, who was human himself, who went through all the temptations we, we, we go through, who had all the pain and suffering that we might experience, actually more. Uh, he is interceding for us like a high priest in the presence of the Almighty God. Because that's what the incarnation did. You see, Jesus came to become a merciful high priest on our behalf, to intercede for us. And then the sixth reason, basically, is that the Bible teaches us that Jesus came to fulfill the promises that was made to David. Listen to Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33. It says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb, in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there will be no end. You see beloved God always keeps his promises. He made a promise to David and when Jesus was born God actually fulfilled the promise that he made to David. And then lastly the Bible teaches us that Jesus came to Provide release and freedom from sin, hurt, and despair. You see, many many people carry heavy burdens on this earth. And it's amazing, even believers. It's as if they don't take the yoke and place it on Christ. They keep their yoke. They carry it themselves. You see, they get pressed down by their sin. They get pressed down by the burdens they, they try to carry. But Jesus came to actually take care of the problem of sin once for all. People don't have to carry their sins any longer. People don't have to carry their burdens anymore. They can bring it to Jesus. It doesn't mean that everything is going to disappear. But it means that Jesus Christ was more than capable when he came to this earth to carry our burdens and our cares and our our concerns and all our things. He can do it. But what they need to do is about a sin, they need to confess their sin. Believe that Jesus Christ alone forgive, can forgive their sin. If they have a burden or if they're carrying hard, on, uh, you know, heavy, uh, something heavy, they need to bring it to Christ. You see, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, I close with this. It tells us so beautifully why Jesus came. And, and this is what Luke writes. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And this is what is applicable to Christ. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and provide or um, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. To announce the jubilee here. The year of being set free from sin, being set free from slavery, being set free from all the burdens that we carry. And and we don't have to carry those things. It's our choice. Don't do it. You don't have to. So let me just summarize quickly. Jesus came to this earth. He's God who became flesh. And that's the amazing thing. And beloved, we need to accept it. We need to accept the incarnation because the Bible reveals it to us. The false teachers, they do not accept that Jesus Christ had two natures, a human and a divine nature at the same time. They they refuse to accept that the Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, would become human in the person of Jesus Christ. They deny those things. And we need to make sure that we do not deny them because then uh, if we do that we are just like the false teachers all right let's pray heavenly father thank you that we can come to you in jesus name thank you for your love and kindness towards us once again thank you that we can study christ thank you that christ jesus is the second person of the trinity who became human who took on human flesh who humbled himself took on the form of a servant to come and die for our sins. Thank you so much for that. Help us to see the false teachers so that we can identify them, discern, and at the end of the day, um, remove them out of our um, circle of influence in our lives. This we pray, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you very much for well, listening today. It is so good to 
to have the privilege to study God's word. I hope it meant something to you. So until next time, God willing, bye-bye.